from the Energy Program at the International Institute for Applied Sciences, Science Systems Analysis, IASA, in Luxembourg, Austria, and is also a visiting professor at the Institute of Thermal Engineering at the Graz University of Technology. Kevan is a mechanical engineer uh, with a doctorate in technical science, and his main research interests are long-term patterns of technological change and economic development, particularly the evolution of the energy system. And you can imagine with that uh, skill set, he is uh, obviously a well thought, sought after person in the IPCC process. I had the pleasure to work with K1 intensively uh, in the fifth assessment report. He was a, an author uh, in working group uh, three and then also in the synthesis report and he's again engaged in the sixth assessment report. Um, and so we are looking forward to listen to K1 on the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Please, K1. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the, for the, for the kind introduction. And um, also to, the, to Proclaim for the invitation to this, to this event. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, so, so my talk uh, somehow uh, builds relatively naturally on Geraldine's really interesting talk about the governance of the Paris Agreement. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the two major international agreements. On the one hand, uh, we have the Paris Agreement, which is definitely a landmark in international climate policy, and as we have heard, uh, is also a major shift from top-down climate policy to one of, of bottom-up pledges, where different countries have uh, uh, put uh, so-called nationally determined contributions on the table to, in order to achieve the short-term goals by 2030. At the same time, the Paris Agreement uh, includes an, a long-term objective to keep warming uh, well below two degrees, perhaps even to one and a half degree. So we have this new climate agreement. And on the other hand, we have roughly at the same time adopted globally by, by, by almost all countries the so-called Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which are much broader than, than climate. And my talk will focus a little bit on the linkages between the Paris Agreement and climate policy, particularly stringent climate policy, and the Sustainable Development Goals. And let me start perhaps um, yeah, with, the, with the Paris Agreement, which was heavily acclaimed, and I think you discussed in a very nice way in the, in the previous presentation. And let us perhaps uh, first of all look into the greenhouse gas implications of the Paris Agreement. So if you think about the next 30 years, and this is shown in this, uh, in this graph here, and we think about the development of greenhouse gas emissions, I think a major question is, uh, are the national pledges which have been made on a voluntary basis uh, and have high legitimacy from the countries, how do they add up compared to where we would need to be by 2030, if you think about the long-term objective of two and, uh, or one and a half degrees. So what you can see here is, uh, across a range of different studies, greenhouse gas projections by 2030, and the increase without any climate policy. Um, we have in, in, in uh, many countries already climate policy in place, which uh, results in greenhouse gas reductions uh, comparable to the ones that you can see here in the, in the orange area or in the yellowish area. And if you think about the NDCs from Paris, these are uh, the estimates uh, across a range of different uh, international institutions. And as you can see, you will have on average uh, a, a reduction, a further reduction compared to policy which is already in place. Uh, with quite some uncertainty. On the one hand, this has to do with the uncertainty in the projections, but actually the dominant uncertainty is the lack of transparency of, and the possibility of interpreting some of the NDCs. So some of these uncertainties is also uh, because there needs to be some sharpening of really understanding what countries have, have pledged. 
If you compare though this, uh, this range here um, in 2030, which is a, a still an increase compared uh, to where emissions were in 2010 or where they are in 2015, uh, there is a, a big gap compared to what the science tells us about where we would need to be uh, by 2030 in order to achieve the two degree target. So probably I'm not telling uh, a lot of news to, to most of you here, uh, but this gap is quite big and I think uh, the major challenge is uh, to think about how can we close uh, this gap and what are the strategies here, how can individual countries uh, be motivated to, to, to increase uh, their, their, their climate pledges. Um, and, and this is where I think uh, the Sustainable Development Goals come in. So the Sustainable Development Goals are goals across a, a range of different objectives. They go further beyond climate. Actually, climate is one of the goals in, 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 uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals, where it's, it's framing more or less environmental, economic and social concerns. There is a lot of emphasis on distributions, on how to eradicate hunger, poverty, how to enhance equity, how to achieve uh, universal action, uh, use of universal education, how to connect, how to connect the poorest, and and very often um, resistance or concerns about climate policies in in the real political realm. And what reduces the leg legitimacy of climate policy is the concerns about possible trade-offs by implementing climate policy for these other objectives. So if you understand how climate policy would interact with all of these other objectives, I think we can enhance our understanding uh, where we would like to set the emphasis in this ratcheting up of the NDCs. So we need to identify, or in other words, we need to try to identify strategies that maximize synergies of climate action with the SDGs and at the same time minimize the trade-offs that might exist, to so minimize the, the, the negative effects that might be there. Because any policy that we set, set from the climate side will have an effect on these different SDGs. So think, for example, about large-scale um, increase of bioenergy. Uh, which uh, requires land, which, which, uh, which will lead to competition um, uh, with food, for example, and might jeopardize uh, SDG uh, number two. So, so I want to focus my talk about uh, some of the recent studies who have tried to explore the linkages between climate action and these uh, other SDG, SDG dimensions. So I think the first thing that we need to recognize in this uh, in this uh, linkages is that by introducing stringent uh, climate policy, uh, we create by reducing the impacts um, benefits across a range of different SDGs, and this is particularly for for uh, mitigating, uh, reducing climate change means uh, 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 benefits for hunger, for health, for water, uh, for energy demand and for, for land and agricultural productivity, so it's a range of different SDGs. And um, the map that I'm showing here is a map of so-called hot spots across these different SDGs. The scale here is basically a scale which looks at uh, where uh, the impoverished, the vulnerable people are affected by multiple, uh, multiple climate change impacts uh, or extreme events in the future. And this is a, uh, a, across these different dimensions. And this is the picture for three degrees. And you can see here uh, the map is relatively red. So, so lots of people exposed across the world. Um, if we go to two degrees, we have some improvement of the situation, but still many people affected. And if we go to one and a half degrees, uh, we still see impacts. Actually, we see already impacts today. Um, 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 but the situation uh, improves a lot. So if you think about climate policy, we have a reduction and we have co-benefits for SDGs from the impact side. Um, at the same time, uh, mitigation actions, as I mentioned earlier, will lead also, may lead also to some trade-offs. And I want to give you an example here, the trade-off of 
stringent climate action uh, with the SDG objective number two, uh, which is eradicating hunger. Uh, so if you think about the current situation of food security, uh, this is about 800 mi million people today are at risk of hunger. Uh, the sustainable development goal number two, uh, um, uh, is, its aspiration is to eradicate hunger by 2030 completely. If you look into uh, scientific uh, publications and ranges across different estimates, uh, there is an improvement in, uh, in food security expected, particularly due to increase in agricultural productivity, but also improved affluence in the, in the developing world. And uh, this is roughly uh, the range of, of estimates that you see in the future about the improvements of food security by the year 2050. And actually, this is a very skewed range. The, 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 the intermediate or middle of the road estimate uh, is about here, so around 100 people by 2050, as a consequence of uh, many of the current policies that are in place uh, for this objective. If you think about the impact of climate policy, uh, you can see here different bars for the uh, INDCs, uh, a scenario which follows a two degree uh, objective and scenarios that follow the one and a half degree objective. And one thing that you can see immediately is that there is a risk that some of the improvements that are in the pipe would, in the developing world, lead to a trade-off. And people who would basically be elevated out of, out of the risk of hunger would fall back into, into and, and, and suffer potential, uh, potential um, uh, adverse effects. And this is a concern that we need to take uh, very se seriously and we need to think about how can we er eradicate those, those trade-offs. That's why this study actually looked also into strategies uh, of how to, how to minimize that effect and this study found that uh, it is possible to a diverse set of different measures so ranging from food aid and food subsidy to enhancements of uh, uh, productivities uh, in, 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 in the affected countries at relatively little cost to eradicate those, those different trade-offs. So one of the main insights here is that whether we will have a negative effect, for example, on food, depends on the instrument that will be used for introducing climate policy. So one needs to have one needs to think very carefully about um, how to design these policies and one needs to have complementary measures. And the big challenge here is, of course, that in many countries who are affected, the institutional and the governments they are relatively weak on the institutional and government side. And the, and the question is, can you introduce relatively complex policies on the ground there? Uh, so, but, but the main conclusion from the scientific literature is that there is a real risk but the risk can be eradicated with complementary measure uh, to, 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 to address them. Uh, let me give you perhaps another example, uh, the situation of how stringent climate mitigation may affect uh, water. Um, and, and, and I'm giving here, I hope this is visible. So what you can see here is basically the impact, possible impact of climate policy on water from energy. This is an aggregated uh, global figure here um, and uh, I think most of you might not be aware that if we compare uh, uh, future developments in, in absence of climate policy, and this is the more, uh, yeah, the dashed black line here to a range of different climate projections, that actually when it, when it comes to the, to the, to the, to the effect on, on water of the of the of of of, um, of um, water water withdrawals and use from energy facilities, which transformed uh, consistent these two degrees uh, scenarios, that uh, many scenarios actually project an increase in water use by by, by power plants. And the reason for that is um, while other scenarios actually also uh, project uh, uh, lower water <coughs> demand, and the reason here is that. The portfolio and the choices that we make also at, uh, for the low carbon options, some are much more water intensive than others. So if you think about centralized solar power, 
or if you think about bioenergy, if you think about uh, nuclear, uh, these are very water intensive technologies. They eradicate greenhouse gases, but at the same time they would increase water consumption. So the portfolio and choices that we make there more or less determine whether we would create a trade-off between climate policy or uh, perhaps even a benefit on the, on the climate water side. Well, an important caveat for water particularly is that it is relevant in some areas of the world, but it's of less relevant in other areas. So to really understand this dimension, one needs to zoom into the local scale. And what you can see here, that's a map of uh, groundwater sustainability. Uh, especially important areas uh, are, for example, the Mediterranean area, uh, but there are areas in China and India and, uh, and um, in, 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 in Mexico and, and, and the US, uh, the high plains, uh, where already now water withdrawals uh, from the environment are much bigger than the environmental flow and the freshwater, uh, 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 the water aquifers and, 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 and storage are actually uh, heavily depleted in some of the regions. So in those regions, of course, the implications of climate policies for the energy sector, if water increases, it makes a big difference. So it makes a big difference for Saudi Arabia. It makes a relatively small difference for, for Switzerland, for example, which has abundant water resources at the first place. Um, there are other SDGs where climate policies lead to high synergies and co-benefits. A very important part here is the co-benefits of climate policies for human health and for air pollution. If you look into uh, future projections of air pollution, um, uh, given uh, the current stringencies of policies, uh, this is a map which uh, for a particular matter, which is the uh, most uh, important uh, air pollutant perhaps because it has the highest mortality effects. Uh, you can see that in large parts of the world uh, we uh, will be uh, overshoot uh, basically the WHO guidelines. So the green cells are those cells which are consistent with WHO guidelines and then the red cells are those cells where we have particular matter concentrations of higher than 35 compared to 10, so more than three times higher of the WHO. And it was three weeks ago, for example, in Beijing, and we, uh, I made my, in my naive uh, uh, imagination, I had thought to go for jogging, uh, but then I realized, I realized that the past, we had 600 parts per million outside, which is 60 times the WHO guidelines. So I decided to go into the fitness center instead of uh, uh, going for jogging. Um, um, but the good news here is that uh, while there is a lot of emphasis on air pollution already, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, policies also in the pipe. And uh, if you look at uh, typical scenarios which combine climate policies, stringent climate policies with the co-benefits and air pollution policies, you can see actually in a one and a half or two degree scenarios uh, that the co-benefits are very large and that the concentrations get close to um, get close to the uh, not you don't reach the WHO guideline concentrations, but the average concentrations over the year get relatively close to that. And this is also one of the reasons and motivations why, for example, China has introduced policies to have a coal peak. So coal it has become a major concern of the Chinese government, and there are programs to reduce coal use in China very heavily. The main reason is not climate, the main reason is air pollution, but they are so strongly connected that we will see a, we see a co-benefit and climate. And China is more and more becoming a, a, leader, a leader in this area. By the way, uh, this strategy would save 2.6 million lives each year between now and 2050 for, uh, 2030 for which this, this figure is. Okay, let me uh, perhaps show you um, and, and um, a, a figure which tries to synthesize across different literatures uh, uh, the effect of um, uh, one and a half, so very, very stringent climate policy. So these are scenarios which are roughly consistent with one and a half C, and the impacts of mitigation on different SDG dimensions. And these are 
At, if you go up here, you can see possible adverse effects. If you go down here, you have co-benefits, so that's a posit positive side effect. And here you can see uh, yeah, many labels of different dimensions. So on this side, you can see that it can have strong mitigation co-benefits, for example, for health, uh, for fresh water ecotoxicity, uh, for some of the resources, uh, for renewable deployment, um, for efficiency, um, etc. But on the other side, you can see mitigation risks. So potential risks for um, biodiversity, for food, uh, risks in terms of uh, putting pressure on some of the mineral resources that would be needed for, for example, renewable energy. And these risks uh, need to be eradicated. In this same study, which actually brings together roughly uh, 20 different uh, institutions in the City Links project, uh, um, we have also looked into uh, how can we eradicate those big bars. Okay, I should perhaps also say these are big bars, but the bar itself indicates an uncertainty range. So there is the potential of a big risk, but the, the risk could also could be very small, the risk could be very big, and it greatly depends on the portfolio of the mitigation action in place. Right? So strategies, for example, let's, let me emphasize strategies that, for example, uh, reduce uh, the use of certain, certain, certain mitigation um, technologies or options, like reducing bioenergy, uh, will reduce the risk for food and biodiversity, for example. Um, on the other hand, the same, the same study looked also into whether these trade-offs can be reduced or er eradicated, and the main conclusion here is yes. I already showed it for food earlier, uh, but I wanted to show you some ranges across, across different, um, different studies, and particularly the, the, the conclusion here is that um, they can be eradicated and reduced significantly at relatively low costs. And particularly if you compare the cost for addressing the trade-off is small compared to the mitigation, the cost that would be needed to mitigate the greenhouse gases. Mitigating greenhouse gases means introducing a fundamental change to the system. Its cost is, 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 not, is actually also not, not gigantic. We are talking here about Policy costs here are given in percent of GDP, and you can see here a relatively wide range across different estimates in the literature to achieve two degree, the two degree target or to achieve the one and a half degree target. This is climate mitigation costs only, and it is roughly between 1% and 7%. That's the full range across the studies. And if you go to one and a half degree, we are talking about 2% to more than. 10%, so we have an increase in the mitigation costs if we increase the stringency of the climate policy for 2 to 1.5. At the same time, the small bars here are the cost to eradicate the trade-off. So if you want to address the, 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 the food trade-offs in the two degree scenarios, these are the costs that are expected if you, if you try to address uh, trade-offs with respect to connecting the poorest, energy access, these are the costs and to addressing the water energy trade-offs that I showed for previously, these are the ranges of costs here. So these are, we're talking about less than 2 to 3% of, of GDP. Uh, but the important thing is that this needs to be part of the climate policy, otherwise you can actually run into, into big dollars. Yeah, let me emphasize perhaps at the end of my presentation that not only climate policy will obviously affect the SDGs, there are a number of SDGs which will affect also uh, climate policy and to which extent actually we will be successful with climate policies. And one of the really important ones are, is, is SDG 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. So if we are very successful in making all of our systems very efficient, if we switch to lifestyles which are perhaps less resource intensive, obviously this will help a lot also with with uh, limiting the greenhouse gases to a level that allows us to meet the one and a half and two degrees uh, from the from the from the from the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, the issue here is um, that, at the one hand, uh, we need to, at the one hand, we need to think about how to bring uh, 
uh, resource use, for example, energy demand down. On the other hand, we need to understand what is the limit. What, what are the limits here? So, what is the minimum energy use that is required for, for decent living, for for provision of basic services that are that are needed? Uh, and and we are thinking a lot about the limiting and improving efficiency, but there is very little research about where this minimum level might lie. And I think it's important to understand this minimum level because this will help us to dis to distinguish between greenhouse gas emissions that are created by affluence and greenhouse gas emissions that might be there because of satisfying the basic needs. So I think this needs to come better together compared to what we have now. And there is there is no, no good understanding about this. Um, we know that there is a correlation between energy use and, 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 and increasing uh, use, um, uh, gigajoules per capita, and for example, the Human Development uh, Index, so higher developed countries like the OECD have much higher uh, energy use, but a very, very wide range. Um, at the same time, yeah, so where, where, where is this level here, uh, if we would try to, to assess it? This correlation is not a causality. And I wanted to, to, to emphasize the need to better understand decent living implications for energy and to that the energy needs, we can look at the environmental footprint and also at the climate change implications of, of those uh, decent living findings. So we need to understand how much energy is needed for food, for water and sanitation, shelter, mobility, basic amenities and, and appliances that might be part of, of decent living. And, and this should not be only energy like most of the studies look into, that energy that are used is used for, for mobility, but also energy that we need to build up the infrastructure, right? So it's about, it's about maintenance, but also building up those infrastructure. And we don't, we don't understand this scientifically really well now. I, I, I scroll to this quite, quite quickly because I think um, we need to rethink a little bit how we are doing uh, our science in this area. And I think in the long term, um, uh, and that's, that's, I think, something that we could even do better in the IPCC because it doesn't have such a strong ethical dimension which is very difficult to, 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 to communicate in the international negotiations. At the end we can then split more or less the greenhouse gas emissions effects of decent living from those of, of the economic, economic and affluence and growth. Um, let me emphasize at the end that I showed lots of very new findings uh, from uh, particularly this project, that's the CD Links project. Uh, you can see the, the web page up here, it's cdlinks.org. If you are interested, please go to our news page. You can find a lot of different new studies that have been coming out uh, uh, about the interactions of climate policies and SDGs. And um, yeah, it includes also uh, uh, basically linkages between mitigation and adaptation if you are interested in. So I just wanted to make to highlight this at the end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, K1, for bringing to our attention this very close relationship between uh, the climate goals uh, laid out in the Paris Agreement and the SG SDGs. I have a, a first question here. Um, there is a, a disparity between the Paris Agreement, who has a, a, a very long-term vision, and the SDGs. Uh, GDs that essentially um, look at the situation in 2030. And that's a, a very short time. Is anybody thinking about uh, this problem uh, in particular, what might come after the UN uh, uh, GDs? Uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a very, very important, uh, important issue. Obviously, uh, many of the SDGs will not be resolved by by 2030. So we have 17 SDGs and uh, you should know that there are 169 sub-goals that have been formulated by, uh, um, yeah, in this UN document which, uh, which describes the SDGs. And some of them, um, some of them are goals where you, you, you have achieved them by 2030. Achieving universal access to energy. 
uh, eradicating hunger by 2030. After 2030, what you need to do is you need to make sure that you, that you actually stay where you are, that you don't at some point offset the benefits. But many other uh, SDGs, if it comes to um, equity, uh, which will not be completely resolved, definitely climate change and so on, they need to be guided then by, uh, I would say, uh, by planetary boundary cons consideration. There is a there is an, um, community effort to try to extend the SDGs to 2050. Um, it's called the World in 2050, actually, and which brings together many, many different institutions who, who work in this area, because the SDGs are very, very, very complex, and actually many of the experts come together the first time. So people who work on poverty usually don't care so much about the greenhouse gas implications of eradicating poverty. All right. Uh, questions to K1, please. Thank you very much for this very, very important link between the Global Development Goals and uh, climate policy. Uh, I'm Martin Schmidt from Ökozentrum. I'm a researcher too, but also an entrepreneur. And my question is these relations to, I mean, we are still living in a, in a monetary system that demands a GDP growth. So if we see 10% of GDP costs until 2030 to change something in this world is not, not a lot, meaning that it is a part of the growth that the uh, economy wants to see anyway in this time. So the question is further, is these costs to change something in the world related to new markets, to things which really are interesting to, to sell to somebody, or is it costs which are um, poorly, let's say, subsidies and, 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 uh, and, and, and other kinds of taxes. Um, so the costs that I've shown, um, they are they're basically looking at the implications for economic growth of setting certain measures. So if you, if you saw 10% uh, costs in terms of 10% of GDP, this means by, by 2050, I think that graph was, by 2050, your economy would be 10% smaller compared to if you wouldn't have set that measure. But, but, that's, uh, but the important thing is that's the overall economic implication. Right? It, the same measure will have major implications for some parts of the economy, will create winners, as well as losers. So uh, a one and a half degree strategy means more or less that we need to stop invest into coal at all. So carbon capture and storage is not an option because of the upstream in emissions of the coal mining sector. Which, um, so it's uh, at the one hand it's biofuels. Um, as you know, I mean this is this is for one and a half degrees, and in a one and a half degree. A world that tries to achieve one and a half degrees needs to some extent to uh, find also how can you remove CO2 from the, from, from the atmosphere. This is the big difference, by the way, of one and a half degree pathways and two degree pathways. You can, the literature shows that you can achieve two degrees without removing CO2 from the, from the atmosphere. And then you have there different options. One option is uh, that is included in the models. Actually, there are more options that the models include at the moment. Uh, the two main options that the model include is uh, afforestation and the so-called BEX option. BEX is bioenergy plus, car plus carbon capture, which allows you to remove uh, the CO2 uh, from the atmosphere because you basically uh, um, yeah, pump back the CO2 underground. And uh, in those scenarios, you have massive land use changes. So basically, you you, you, even forestation would change unmanaged forests sometimes, or reforestation would change unmanaged forests into managed forests, or you would expand land a lot for bioenergy. This is, for the food side, this is roughly about 30% of the effect. 70% of the effect is actually the greenhouse gas price effect. So you have to think about this, that, that prices for food may increase a lot because of the price of energy and because of that energy you need for food, let's say fertilization, 
and the price of the food itself if it creates greenhouse gases, it, it, it would be affected by the price. So, 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 so the, the big, big difference here is the effect of the price and the effect of the land use change. And the effect of the price is in the models generally to be larger than the effect of the land use change. I think this is very important to keep in mind. Which means that if you even avoid the use of bioenergy, you would not avoid the risk for the food sector, for the poor. What you need to do there is, you, you need to, to make sure that they don't see the price. And this is something that all the developing countries do already. So there is no developing country where, where basic food is not subsidized on this planet. So not, we are not talking about you know, uh, um, utopian solutions. These are solutions that are, that are known to the developing world how to do it. The question is, can they pay it? Do they need support from others to pay it? And there I would say yes. Perhaps a final question? Uh, population dynamics, population growth. How is that uh, influencing, and uh, is there any discussion about potential to control, to to avoid? Yeah, so we, we didn't look into population control as a climate mitigation measure, <laughs> and most most of the studies actually don't. There is a really interesting study by Brian O'Neill in the literature, who shows that. Uh, greenhouse gases emissions basically go down when you have lower populations. However, usually what goes hand in hand uh, with a reduction with with, uh, with limiting population growth is increasing affluence. Usually, fertility comes down because of changed um, uh, role of women in society and much higher education levels, which have very positive feedback loops to the economy. And the question is, which of those two dynamics actually, uh, um, which of those two dynamics um, at the end are dominant? Um, uh, there is some research uh, using the different shared socioeconomic pathways, these are the SSPs, which will underpin the, the AR6. Um, and there you have scenarios with different population population levels. Population is not the major the major question. The major question is what people do, what technology they will have available, what's the productivity of the economy. That's much it has a big influence that the number of people. All right, thank you very much. Please uh, uh, give a hand to all the speakers of this morning before